Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue talking about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be the genetics of behavior. So like always, let me get you your objectives, and then we'll get going. So by the end of this video, there are two things that I want you to know or be able to do. The first one is to be able to provide examples to illustrate genetically controlled behavior. And the second is to discuss the contradiction of altruism. So those are the things I need you to know. Let's start talking about some stuff. So first thing I want to talk about is the debate between nature and nurture. It's something that scientists have debated forever. And the basic idea is kind of thinking about our behaviors that we exhibit on a regular basis, are those behaviors a result of our genetic makeup? Are they a result of the environment that we grew up in? Are they a combination of the two? Jury's still out. But we do know that there are some behaviors that are controlled by specific genes. And I'm going to give you a couple examples in the animal world to kind of illustrate this point. So first example of a genetically controlled behavior is called the fruitless gene or the fru gene in Drosophila. Um, scientists have found that there is one gene in Drosophila that when turned on or when activated produces all of the kind of neurological wiring that makes male fruit flies behave as males. It gives them the ability to do mating dances, courtship behavior, um, the actual act of mating, all that goes together with this one FRU gene. Um, scientists have found that in flies that have a mutation in this gene, in male flies that have a mutation in this gene, they don't exhibit the courtship behaviors that usually are associated with males. So that's why it's called the fruitless gene. They also found that if they genetically manipulate this gene in females, the females will exhibit the same behavioral characteristics as the male. They've also found that this FRU gene is actually kind of like a master gene that controls the expression of several other genes. So this one gene is responsible for all of the wiring and behavioral characteristics that, male, that make male fruit flies act as they do. So that's one example of a gene controlling behavior directly. There are a couple other examples. Um, one is found in lace wings, which is that insect there on the side. Um, there are 15 different species of lacewings. All of them look identical, but each one has a very unique mating song, and the individuals of that species will only respond to the correct mating song for their species. So scientists wanted to know if the songs were learned or if they were genetically inborn, and basically what they did is they took lacewings, they reared them in the lab apart from individuals of their own species, so they're kind of in isolation, and then they crossbred them with individuals of the other species producing hybrids of the two species and what they found is that the hybrids sang songs that were actually a combination of the songs of the two species so that was another example of saying hey there are several genes within this one insect that are responsible for responsible for controlling different elements of the song and if you shuffle those genes you get different songs and then in voles which are small little mouse-like rodents um, there are several different types. Some types give really intense care to the young. The other ones do not at all. And scientists researched this and found that it's related to a neurotransmitter called vasopressin. And vasopressin, they found that in voles that give really good care to their young, there was high concentrations of vasopressin receptors in the brain. Um, those that did not give care to the young didn't have as many receptors for vasopressin. And then they did some experiments, flipped some genes on and off, and figured out that in the species that doesn't give care to their young, if they increase the genes that produce the receptors for vasopressin, those animals will give more care to their young and exhibit more caring behaviors towards their offspring. So those are just some examples of uh, behaviors being con specifically controlled by genes. I'm going to give you one more about bird migration, then we're going to talk about altruism a little bit. This is actually a very interesting case. Um, there's a bird called the black cap. It grows up and is hatched in Germany, and then typically, up until it was the 1950s, um, these birds would migrate from Germany to Spain, and then from Spain on down into Africa to spend the winter, and then, of course, they'd migrate back to Germany. In the 1950s through the 70s, scientists started to notice that the black caps began, instead of migrating straight south, they started heading west towards, uh, not Germany, towards England, and they would start doing their wintering, or at least part of their migration route, through England. Um, scientists still speculate about why they did that, 
but they found that the frequency of birds that started to make this migration increased over time to a point where now a good uh, proportion of the population actually migrates towards England instead of towards Africa. So that would be an example of probably several genes controlling this behavior. Um, scientists are still working on which genes specifically do it, but they hypothesize that since they are seeing more birds migrating towards England than towards uh, Spain and Africa, there is a gene that controls that that's becoming more frequent in the population. Now, let's kind of switch gears, talk about altruism for a second. Altruism is basically behavior that is selfless. It's behavior that does not increase the fitness of the individual, and it actually increases the fitness of whoever the altruistic individual has helped. Now, evolutionarily speaking, altruism is kind of a problem because for natural selection to work, every individual needs to have the desire to pass along its own genetic material to increase its own reproductive fitness and success, and to basically pass its own genes along. Um, Richard, I think it was Richard Dawkins. Yeah, Dawkins wrote a book called The Selfish Gene, and it was basically based on the premise that all behavior can be uh, kind of explained by um, humans, other individuals, trying to get their genetic material passed along. Now, the idea that some species, and humans in, in particular, um, exhibit behavior that seems to decrease their own chances of survival and decrease their own chances of passing along uh, genetic material to the next generation seems to be kind of problematic. Um, to that end, scientists have made some attempts to try to explain an evolutionary basis for altruism, so I'm going to talk through a couple of those and then we'll wrap up. The first one is the idea of inclusive fitness, and this is basically the idea that if you are with related individuals, they carry some of the genetic material that you also carry. So by helping them to survive, whether it gets you hurt or not, helping them to survive in, indirectly passes along your genetic material since you guys share some genetic material. Um, some examples of this would be like social grooming there, um, bees there are in beehives tons and tons of worker bees that are sterile. They can't pass along genetic material because they have the inability to reproduce, but they help the queen to pass along genetic material, thus indirectly passing along their own. So that's the idea of inclusive fitness, which basically says, you know, if I, you're not going to pass on your own genetic material, you can at least help somebody that has some of your genetic material passed along, whether a brother or a cousin or whatever. Um, now this is an interesting thing. Scientists like to try to put numbers to things. So there was a scientist who actually tried to set up an equation to predict whether it was, uh, I guess, evolutionarily beneficial for an organism to act altruistically. And the formula is based upon how closely related um, one organism is to another. And then it uses that, rela that ratio of relationship to figure out, all right, is it beneficial for one organism to help another out. If the numbers work out to where um, helping the individual out increases the chances of your genetic material being passed on, then according to the scientist, natural selection would say, yes, you should do that action. Um, if the numbers don't work out, if it would actually be more beneficial for you to pass your genetic material on directly rather than acting altruistically, then this formula says, no, you will not act in that manner. So it's an interesting attempt to try to put some numbers to this phenomenon that is known as altruism. And this is the last thing for the day. There's also the idea of reciprocal altruism, which is the idea of what's in it for me. Um, some species do exhibit some sorts of reciprocal altruism in that it's the idea that when two individuals meet up, I might help you out with the expectation that next time we meet, you're going to help me out. Now, this has only been observed in some species, um, and it's been observed in species that meet up frequently because this doesn't work well if you're just going to meet up one time. So this idea of doing a favor in hopes that you will have a favor done to you later on, increasing your own chance of survival and fitness, is another attempt to um, explain the problem of altruism for natural selection. So that's it for the day. Um, I hope this little tutorial was helpful for you. My name is Mr. Kite. This has been the Lab 207 webcast. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again.